Dark Commissar, please. What no. is it called? Dark Commissar? Yeah. Do you know who sang it? Do you, George? You guys want to test my 80s music again? Right, I'm sing- not paid to know that. You're not paid to know it, yeah. And I just, and I, I think I've been singing the song. Dar Karmazar is the name of the song? Okay, uh, you have no chance. <laughs> you don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> no, who sings that song? Falco. Okay, Yeah. fine. Come on, get with it. Uh, Snappy. The cancel culture is not a threat to civilization. Not a threat to civilization. Hmm. A specter is haunting Western democracies. No, it is not as the surging pandemic, mass death, or catastrophic unemployment. It is, if you believe Donald Trump and some of his critics, the end of free speech and the advent of cancel culture, quote unquote. Um, Trump defined a new menace to civilization in his speech at Mount Rushmore, talking about far left fascists, driving people from their jobs, shaming dissenters, demanding total submission from anyone who disagrees. Right. That's not happening? Okay. Uh, and then uh, that's. Uh, begot the Harper's letter from mostly people who are on the left of some profile in academia and elsewhere. Uh, But um, the argument from those on the left, no, it's not really a threat. Free speech has never been more widely available than it is today. Oh, that's an interesting parsing. So much so that the cacophony of voices liberated by digital media too frequently drowns out well-informed and sensible opinion. That sounds like a minder. Trump, who blurts out several hot takes every day, is himself an example of the verbal incontinence enabled by Twitter in recent years. It's also true that historians, economists, and sociologists are able to hold Twitter discussions of a quality that shames much of what appears on the pages of major newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. Um, Today, conservative as well as liberal and left-wing outlets feature a multiplicity of opinion and analysis, except at the New York Times opinion page, I would add, but okay. Much more variety is still needed. Human experience is always growing, and uh, many uh, book and magazine publishers are sincerely trying to achieve it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's nothing to really worry about is uh, the overarching message. Do you think that's true? There's nothing really to worry about? Um, this is uh, a piece uh, by... Uh, uh, Pankaj, Pankaj Mishra, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, um, uh, that appears in Yahoo Finance. Uh, it's the position that uh, many academics uh, and others on the left hold, uh, and it's redounding down to the students who argue that uh, I'm for free speech, but I'm not for hate speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Which, but what is hate speech? Everyone has a different definition of hate speech. Uh, and so uh, let's get a handle on it, because we, we talked a little bit earlier in the show with uh, Gerard Baker from The Wall Street Journal. Is this a real thing or are conservatives like me just uh, creating a bit of a tempest in a teapot over one off incidents of uh, you know, professional consequences for unpopular opinions and so forth? To help us, we're pleased to be joined again by William Jacobson. He's a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. Also the founder of the uh, excellent LegalInsurrection.com blog and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. So we're uh, overstating the threat that uh, some of the uh, intolerance for diversity of views on campus and corporations elsewhere uh, uh, presents. Are we, are we overstating that threat? No, I don't think so. I think that it is a real problem. Uh, It is something which is really focused on silencing people who don't have job protection, silencing people who worry about their careers. It's really not focused on the high-profile people who get attacked. They're simply the target, but the victims here is the, the larger society. And I know that because I'm going through it now at Cornell Law School. I published two pieces in early June about the Black Lives Matter movement. One was accurately recounting how the claim of hands up, don't shoot based on the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, which is the foundational narrative of the Black Lives Matter movement is a fabrication. The Justice Department under Eric Holder proved beyond any doubt that Michael Brown did not have his hands up and he didn't say don't shoot. In fact, he got shot because he punched a policeman in the face and tried to steal his gun. Uh, So I wrote that. 
the second thing I wrote is that you cannot divorce the rioting and the looting and the tearing down of society that happened in throughout the country, not just an isolated instance, from the foundational narrative and foundational philosophy of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, who are openly Marxist, who are openly calling for the destruction of the nuclear family, and who are anti-capitalist. So I said, you can't divorce what's happening from the ideology of the leadership. Those two things have resulted in a series of actions against me. There's an alumni email and petition campaign to get me fired. There's a student boycott by over a dozen student groups of my course. There is a public letter of denunciation signed by 21 of my colleagues. And there is a dean statement denouncing me as not conforming with the values of the law school. And so this is what we talk about with cancel culture. Now, I have job protection, not tenure, but it's something similar. So the dean also announced that I wouldn't be fired or no disciplinary action taken because of my job protection. But that's not the point. The point is you have a lot of people who are unprotected. I've received uh, many, many emails from students privately who say a lot of people in the building support you, students, but we're all afraid to speak up. And, yeah. uh, oh. and that's, re- that's really what's happening. It's, it's an enforced silence and conformity. But don't focus on me. Don't focus on J.K. Rowling. Don't focus on the people who have protection. It's all the people who get scared and bullied into silence. I've received hundreds, multiple hundreds of emails from around the country once I went public with my story from people who say they're scared to death to speak up at work. They're not only scared to death to speak at work, they're scared to say anything outside of work that could be used against them. Well, it's interesting because it, it includes people who are protected. That's how severe uh, the culture seems to be. Glenn Lowry, um, last weekend in uh, the Wall Street Journal interview, as you know, a, a economics professor from Brown, so in the Ivy League, when he wrote a response letter to the Brown University president's letter talking about what the university's policy is going to be on, on, on anti-racism and things like that, Glenn Lowry, who's a black American, uh said, you know, I basically, I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate a, a Brown University president uh, imposing a particular viewpoint on the university on a very, very charged political uh, discussion. And Lowry said in the Wall Street Journal weekend interview that he did, about three of his 500 colleagues at Brown communicated their support to him. And that was privately, just communicated to him at all. And 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 Lowry says, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I, he I'm I've got tenure. But if I was, you know, starting out, I didn't have tenure. I'd only been at Brown a couple of years. You know, there was no way they would tolerate the response that I issued publicly to the Brown University president's letter. So you even have people who are tenured, who are protected, who do know better, who are unwilling to privately say to a respected and accomplished academic like Glenn Lowry. Hey, Glenn, you make some good points there. Yeah, not a single person at the law school has spoken out privately to me or publicly about a really unprecedented student boycott of a course because of the professor's political statements made outside of the campus and that have nothing to do with the course. I teach a course on investment disputes. I don't teach a politics course (laughs) or course on race relations. I teach investment disputes. It's a very popular course. It's a small course, but we typically have three or four or five people applying for each spot. And there are a dozen, and so this is really unprecedented. They've set up essentially a political litmus test that if you are a student who now takes my course, you are going against the Black Lives Matter movement. You are going against these other students. So they've turned an educational decision into a political decision. Not a single professor that I'm aware of, uh, not a single administrator has said, hey, you know, boycotting a course and putting this impediment, whether you have the right to do it or not, is the wrong thing to do. Right. Nobody has spoken up about that. Well, and how do you personally stomach all the hatred? I mean, is it, how do you process it? Well, one of the things is I, I know that I have a lot of support. I mean, and that's very comforting. I know. So really what keeps me going, because a lot of people say, why do you stay in such a place? And the reason is because uh, students, staff, and even some faculty, a lot of alumni, a lot of people in the community communicate with me. Mm-hmm. There is almost nobody on the Cornell campus who is willing to stand up and speak out on these issues, not in conformity with the, the institutional view. And so I, I know I have a lot of support, 
It's just not public because people are afraid. So that is really how I stomach it. Yeah, you know, the Wall Street Journal uh, does this weekly future view column, perhaps you've read it, uh, where it uh, surveys uh, a handful of uh, uh, undergrad and graduate students from around the country and asks them to weigh in on a particular topic. And this week, it was cancel culture. And it's, it's, uh, it's sort of encouraging, and it must be encouraging to you to hear from students privately uh, who are supportive, because um, while there are some opinions I definitely disagree with, and, and in particular on this installment with respect to cancel culture. The, they're uh, a couple of paragraphs each. They're well-crafted statements. They're thoughtful statements. Uh, they're measured statements. Measure in this time, day and age. And so, and it, you know, and then it's across the collegiate experience. It's not just Ivy League or it's not just high-profile schools. It's uh, people in a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different schools all over America uh, over the course of several weeks if you read this column. It, it actually has provided some encouragement for me as somebody who's a bit fatalistic about where American culture is and intellectual freedom is, that you do have a lot of young people that are actually in these places, in these incubators, and they're seeing them for what they are and what they are not. Well, I think at some point it will break through and some more people will get the, the courage to come out and to talk about these issues. But it's very tough. And I don't blame the students for being quiet because, you know, I'm 61 years old. I've basically had my career. Uh, and uh, But if you're 24, 25, and you're just about to graduate law school and you're going to go out onto the job market, you cannot afford to have out on the Internet things said about you, false things said about you right. that have been said about me because every employer, prospective employer, Googles hires or hires somebody to do that. And if there's even a whiff of controversy about the person, they're not going to hire you. Whether They're not going to spend the time to look into whether it's true or not. If there's these accusations. So I, I totally understand. I don't blame the students. I blame the administration for allowing this, uh, this atmosphere to, to fester. Uh, uh, administration at multiple levels, university and law school level, deserve a lot of the blame here now. And uh, and it's unfortunate, but I hope at some point we get to the point where people can come out of the closet, so to speak, with their personal views on political issues. Uh, Amy Wax, who's a professor of law at Penn, uh, when she's not being you know put on administrative leave, um, is said uh, a couple of years ago on this show that... Uh, the Ivy League is gone. Uh, it should be if it was uh, her choice to make wave a wand. What would you do? She said, I would shut it down and start over. It's not salvageable. What's your view? I, I you know, and I have this conversation with, you know, a, a lot of people. I don't think it's salvageable. I mean, a lot of people say, well, what can I do to help foster a diverse ideological viewpoints on campus? And I don't know that there's anything. It is so far gone. I mean, there was a study by the Cornell Sun student newspaper two or three or four years ago studying donations from faculty to yeah. political candidates. Yeah. And it was like 97 percent went to Democrats. Uh, and that probably understates the ideological uniformity. I mean, the, the faculty will be there long after the students have left. The faculty is behind a lot of these ideological issues. And. I don't, you know, I don't see how it changes. There was somebody I saw interviewed, there's no reason to doubt his numbers, that, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was like 60, 40 liberal to conservative. You know, and 10 years ago, it was like eight to one. And now of new hires, people coming into the faculty system, it's something like 38 or 40 to one people who self-identify as liberal or leftist. And liberal is kind of a broad term. A lot of them are what we would call hard left. Um, and uh, so it's completely gone. I mean, it, it, the university system uh, nationwide, and there may be exceptions on particular campuses, is so skewed and so out of balance. And this is not something that took place in two years. It's been a generation that it would take a generation to change. So if you want to have an impact this year or next year, I don't see the likelihood of changing universities as realistic. He is Professor William Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School, founder of the LegalInsurrection.com blog and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, good luck on campus, and thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And he joined us on our turnkey.proanswer line.